Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. So yesterday they dropped the first poster for Avengers Age of Ultron and it sparked quite a bit of discussion, not just about whether or not the poster is any good, but you know, kind of what it says about the goings on behind the scenes in terms of deal making, which actors are more important, etc. So we're not only going to go over the poster as the first story of the day, but actually the viewer question is about this poster as well. Alright, so let's start off. Here it is in all its photoshopped glory. Uh, I think a lot of people made fun of this at first when they saw it. It's a fun poster. I don't even know if this movie really needs a poster. Everybody knows when it's coming out. Everyone's going to see it. But I guess, you know, it's a formality and what are you going to hang in the multiplex when you want to uh, put it right outside, you know, the theater where it's playing, right? Uh, I would have preferred character posters, perhaps, like they did for the first film, but I think this group shot uh, gets the job done. It's very reminiscent of the Comic-Con poster. They had everyone pieced together day by day, as you might recall, from the summer. Uh, but as far as the photoshopped elements go, I think the reason that it seems more photoshopped uh, than the other posters, I mean, of course, they've all been photoshopped, but I think it's because it seems like they were all t these it seems like these images of each character were taken from different photo shoots for different purposes and then just repurposed for this group shot because everyone seems to be in a different mindset right like the hulk for instance totally overreacting i think everybody else would be like hey buddy we're not quite at fight mode yet uh dial it down a notch uh, of course, everybody's looking in a different direction. The lighting's a little different on everyone. I thought it was very funny. A lot of people said that Nick Fury looked unusually sad, which is true. Uh, it's like, come on, cheer up, buddy. You're still in the movie. You even made the poster. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. Although I think it's because they just wanted to make sure they had some diversity in here. T'Challa can't come soon enough, the Black Panther. Uh, and of course, um, uh, then of course, the very strong rumor at this point that Miles Morales will be the new Spider-Man. But he'll have a mask on, so that still won't help. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's go through each character here. Uh, I want to start at, out actually with the vision. As you can see, he's right up there at the top with the sun behind him because they're still keeping him under wraps. Uh, I made a video about this a couple weeks ago with the set when the second trailer debuted, or trailer 1.5 I think is a more accurate representation of that. Uh, and that they really are probably going to save him for the movie or maybe the very last minute push to get you into the theater. Uh, I'm fine with that. There's so much going on here. Why dilute the debut of the vision, right? I think it would be great to experience him for the first time on the silver screen or until Thursday night when someone takes a photo of it and posts it on the internet, right? Um, I think it's interesting Ultron didn't make the trailer, uh, but you can see his minions, of course, all in the background. Now, also, we'll start out here on the side after Vision. Uh, another group of characters that isn't getting a lot of love, uh, but I think for different reasons, is uh, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. They, you know, they're really kind of just stuck on the side there. I, I've been surprised at how these characters have been treated, considering the excitement that audiences have to meet them, especially since they're, you know, it, uh, taken from the uh, the mutant, the X Men uh, part of the Marvel universe, and you know there's been great uh, discussion about whether or not that was uh, really appropriate, or if it was a fair game from Fox, of course, which is supposed to own the rights to all the mutants. Maybe that's why they've continued to sideline them. Maybe they're like, you know what, Fox hasn't said anything yet, but we might have picked a fight here. Let's just see. Maybe because Quicksilver was so popular in X Men: Days of Future Past. They're like, let's not build up a character that secretly in our heart of hearts we know can't quite compare to what Brian Singer and Evan Peters created uh, last summer. Uh, Scarlet Witch, though, I have high hopes for her. It's another female member of the team, but so far uh, I hope she really delivers in the movie because she is not delivering in the ad campaign. But speaking of women on this poster, I think Scarlett Johansson looks amazing. I'm so glad to finally see her powered up. Uh, I think that's great. I think it makes her look more like she's a part of this team or super uh, powered. Uh, only now at this point, Hawkeye is left behind. A lot of people have been making fun of uh, Black Widow, as, as we've discussed, saying, you know, what does she really bring to the team besides her ability to kick? Thanks, Seth MacFarlane. But I think Seth MacFarlane actually did her a favor because it's allowed this to be, you know, out in the open and that now Joss Whedon and Marvel and Disney can address it and fix it. I also saw a lot of people say they were happy that she wasn't doing like a sexy pose. We all know what that is. It's famous from the comics. It's that when you twist your body and you manage to show off both your chest and your butt. Uh, although Nightwing has sometimes uh, done that pose as well, which I think really speaks to his, uh, you know, um, uh, multi-gender appeal. Uh, but so I was very happy to see that as well. I saw some people say though in, re uh, in response, 
hey, God forbid a sexy character acts sexy. Well, you know what? A sexy character is sexy no matter what they do, right? I mean, I don't see any guys here doing the, you know, there's no night wings here. There's no guys showing off their butts or uh, shirtless, uh, you know, pecs and abs. So I think that uh, I think the real issue is that I think everyone, especially female viewers, are just tired of the female character being the only one who's the eye candy. She still looks very pretty. Uh, she looks just as attractive as her male co-stars, and you can just enjoy them in action poses, and she finally gets an action pose. I think it's an important choice. It's a step forward for the character. It's a step forward for women in comic book movies. It's a step forward for women in Hollywood in general. And I think it's also some, somewhat of an acknowledgement of the importance of them to the comic book fan base. Uh, you know, it's not just guys dragging their girlfriends girls uh, and women want to go too. So I think she looks great. I'm excited to see her use those, uh, use her, her, uh, her, her widow's sting. I'm very excited about it. Uh, now, there's some people saying, who is more prominent in this poster? Is it Chris Evans or is it Robert Downey Jr.? I think it's equal. I think Chris Evans has a slight lead, although you can see Robert Downey Jr. in the credits is the only one with an above the title, uh, you know, above the name of the film credit. We'll discuss this more in the viewer question that this has to deal with about uh, these two individuals. Uh, but I think they're pretty even. I think the, the Captain America the Winter Soldier was incredibly popular, obviously, at the box office, also very highly regarded by the fan base. So you really see two guys now leading the... Marvel Cinematic Universe, which of course they're capitalizing on in Civil War. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, as you can see, is sliding towards the back because the Thor movies uh, aren't doing quite as well. Uh, and Hulk, though, very prominently showed. I like that he looks so much like Mark Ruffalo. You know, one of the problems with previous Hulk incarnations is that when he hulked out, when Bruce Banner hulked out, it was almost as if it was an entirely different person. But I think that not, not only in the first Avengers, but I think even more so with the second one, you really do feel like that is a distorted hate, uh, distorted with anger and hate version, and gamma radiation, of course, a version of Mark Ruffalo. So I think that's fantastic. And of course, Hawkeye's on there. He, he complained. He got on there. He's considered an important part. But I think until I find something more for him to do, it's just going to seem like uh, Jeremy Renner service. All right, so that's the poster. I'm curious to what you guys think of it. Do you think they could have done a little better? Uh, do you, I think this gets the job done. You know, it's not quite that cinematic. It's not really, you know, trying to be edgy or out there. Uh, but I think my only thing is I would have liked character posters. Uh, but I'm curious to what you guys think. All right, so let's move on to the second story of the day. We're going to talk female Ghostbusters. All right, so Paul Feig has given us a little bit of a tidbit of what he's uh, attempting to do with the second, uh, well, the reboot, actually, second incarnation of the Ghostbusters franchise, besides make it all women. And I think it's a very interesting and smart choice. So he was quoted yesterday, quoted around the web, repeated, that he is going to actually try and borrow a few pages from the Walking Dead book. He said he's a big fan of the show. He likes what they do there. I think a lot of people do, obviously. It's one of the most watched shows on television, and especially on cable. It's kind of reinvented the cable game to some degree. It helped launch Better Call Saul recently to make that a huge hit, biggest debut ever, I believe, in cable history. Really quite the phenomenon. So I think Paul Feig saw that and said, hey, this is what people are enjoying right now with their horror films and their, you know, uh, zombie films, which, of course, falls under some degree the Ghostbusters uh, uh, canopy or tent. So he's like, why not incorporate that here? So he says, you know, what he wants to take is the idea of the gauntlet run. Now, what that means is, you know, your characters have a goal that they have to achieve, you know, in a scene, like an action scene, and so they have to get from point A to point B. It's a really good uh, kind of storytelling tactic. It's used to great effect in many different mediums uh, because its uh, structure is built into the very idea of it. You know, it's hard to come up with, uh, you know, structure for a story. That's why there are so many rules in place and tricks like the gauntlet run. So again, it's getting your characters from point A to B within like a scene or maybe it could be a, you know, a group of seeds, but uh, there's a ticking clock aspect to it. Like you have to do A to B at a certain amount of time, and there are obstacles in your path. So they say, Paul Fogg said he's felt that The Walking Dead did this quite well, so it's something he wants to bring to his Ghostbusters. And I think that's very interesting, because that implies more action. Because, you know, the first Ghostbusters had wonderful special effects for the time, but it was primarily a comedy. Uh, a very well-written comedy, but just, you know, a comedy about ghosts. And while there were certainly a high stakes, I think that overall, I don't think it was ever scary. I don't think you were ever actually worried about the safety of any of the characters. But that maybe seems like something they want to change with this new Ghostbusters. Of course, gritty realism is the trend right now in Hollywood. I don't think any of us thought it would be applied to Ghostbusters, especially because it's a comedic franchise with this cast from SNL. But it looks like Paul Fogg wants to maybe try and take it there to some degree. So if he's going in this direction, that would mean a more action-packed, 
a more intense, and also maybe a, to some degree a scarier version of Ghostbusters. I think that's a great idea. I saw a lot of people say this was a great idea yesterday. And you know what? It changes the conversation from just, this is an all-female Ghostbusters. And if they could pull off something so intense and action-packed with an all-female cast of Ghostbusters, that would be even more exciting. But I do feel... Uh, as I said when they first announced the cast, what will be really important here is the casting of Data. The Data role, of course, played by Sigourney Weaver in the first movie. I think that needs to be a really strong male personality to balance this out and not make it seem like a chick flick. Also, there's the Janine secretary role. There are lots of other male characters that could be brought in here. And also, maybe we'll have a villain who's you know, a male ghost, uh, I think, to really make sure this is something where everybody feels they're a part of the party. Don't uh, count Paul Fine just out yet. I think Spy, the film he has coming up with Melissa McCarthy, looks also very good. And he brought in Jude Law and Jason Statham there to balance things out. So I think he knows what he's doing, and I think this is a very good, uh, I think he's, not only does he know what he's doing in putting a movie together, but I think he knows how to advertise one. And I think pretty walking dead into the conversation so early on is very smart before people form preconceptions of the film that are not in its favor. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story of the day is about Sony. They found their new person to take over for Amy Pascal and run the studio. Sadly, it is not Jeff Robinow, but it seems he wasn't even one of the final uh, people they were considering, which is too bad, but I'm sure his production company will hopefully move forward. Although, there was also a story in The Hollywood Reporter recently about how his money from China doesn't seem to be materializing. It doesn't seem to be materializing anywhere for anybody. China's promising to fund a lot of projects, but has yet to deliver. Very interesting development on that front. But today we're talking about uh, uh, Sony and Tom Rothman, who got the job. Now, Tom Rothman was the head of Fox, the uh, Fox studio, for quite a long time. I actually got to interview him on the red carpet at the New York Film Festival, f uh, Festival for The Life of Pi, one of the last films he made at the studio before he was pushed out uh, and Jim uh, Giannopoulos took over. I've talked to Jim Giannopoulos as well. Uh, he's a very nice individual. I don't, I'm not quite sure what went down between the two of them, why uh, Jim stayed and took over and Tom left, but, you know, he left. It wasn't quite of his choosing, but I think he seems to have landed on his feet just fine. But he was a very nice individual when I talked to him, and Life of Pi did very well for the studio, obviously. Uh, and also, it was a, an interesting film because while it was a prestige Oscar contender, it was also a blockbuster. They worked really hard to use utilize 3D technology in a, not only a you know intellectual way because it was an Oscar film, uh, which won I believe the Oscar for Ang Lee for Best Director, but it also you know was something that tried to entice moviegoers to see it in the theater. I actually saw Life of Pi uh, streamed on demand. I regretted it because I thought the 3D looked like it would be so well utilized in the film. But anyway. Tom Rothman is a very interesting choice. He has a very prestigious career, but there's one area where I think you're going to be a little concerned. Now, the good things he did, he founded Fox Searchlight, which of course is one of uh, the premier, uh, you know, prestige production or distribu distribution brands in the industry. Fox Searchlight, of course, is the subset of the Fox overall larger brand, which deals with their uh, awards contenders. It's still very much uh, in the race. It's, a, it, uh, it's able to get films in the forefront. It's a very, very good company. So he founded them and also one of the first. So he helped start to have, start the ball rolling on these prestige brands. Of course, Harvey Weinstein really was the first first, but you know, that was, a, Miramax was an independent studio before it was picked up by, purchased by Disney. So you see uh, Tom Rothman starting this in-house at the studios. It led to led to brands like uh, Sony Pictures Classics, Paramount Vantage for a while, so very interesting indeed. Then, of course, while he was at the studio, he oversaw some huge hits, such as Titanic and Avatar. Those all turned out great. They were also huge Oscar contenders. Titanic, a big Oscar winner. Avatar, not so much. But still, it was nominated across the board. It won in, like, the special effects categories. But then also, he oversaw the Marvel movies, the first round of Marvel movies that Fox did uh, when they had those rights. I think they worked sometimes, and sometimes they didn't work. So I think that a lot of fans didn't like what happened ultimately with those movies. Uh, I think Fox has turned things around, and that's under the new leadership. So uh, I think people might have some concern with Tom Rothman coming on uh, and now taking over another Marvel property, and that, of course, is Spider-Man, which is still very much in Sony's control. Uh, as again, as we've discussed, this deal only allows... Fox, I mean, um, a Marvel to use uh, the Spider-Man character in their own movies and to therefore give some input into what Sony does, etc., because they kind of share the character now. But the standalone Spider-Man movies are still totally made in-house at Sony. They'll check with Feige, but they have final say on every single aspect. Although, I think 
That's another reason, though, it's been uh, this Miles Morales rumor is really building steam, and because so many of the emails that were leaked from the Sony hacks seem to come off as racist, that's another reason people are saying that they were going to want to go with Miles Morales. Not the best reason to go with Miles Morales, but hey, any port in a store, right? Anything that gets the job done. So that's the third story of the day. Let's get on to the viewer question from BTT viewer Tommy West. And as I said, it's about that Avengers Age of Ultron poster. So Tommy says, hey, Grace. Big fan of the show. Keep up with the great work. Thank you, Tommy. My question is regarding the recent Avengers 2 trailer and now posters. Chris Evans looks like he has been demoted down to fourth billing in the movie when he was second for Avengers 1. After the success of Winter Soldier and the lead into Civil War, why would Marvel not want arguably one of their biggest characters not front and center for the marketing and the film itself? Does all this mean Captain America will have a reduced role this time around? Not at all, Tommy. I think that when you look at a movie poster, when you look at the billing of uh, characters, it never has to do with how important they are in the actual movie. Uh, you'll often notice sometimes in a poster, I'll bring the poster back up here so we can look at it again. You'll often notice in a movie, a, a poster for a movie, that sometimes the names at the top of the poster don't match with where the people's faces actually are. You have the name of one actor over the face of another, and it's very bizarre. You're like, why wouldn't you put the faces with the names, right? Well, this is all negotiations. This is all, you know, a power play. This is something that's hammered out with the agents and the producers in the studio. So, of course, Robert Downey Jr. gets first because I think this is something he probably built into his deal a long time ago. And especially when he renewed after, um, you know, Iron Man 3. I believe, yes, after Iron Man 3, that's when he renewed. So I'm sure he said, you know, my name goes above everything till the end of time, or at least until the end of this new contract. Uh, so, for instance, that's why he's the only above the name person. Everybody else is listed after Age of Ultron when you look at the uh, the fine print at the bottom. It goes Robert Downey Jr. and then Avengers Age of Ultron and then it starts to list the rest of the cast. So that's very interesting. So that's totally Robert Downey Jr. power play and I think he deserves it considering the fact that while other characters are starting to come into their own and other actors, Scarlett Johansson, I think she's by far and away after Chris Evans the, the biggest uh, person on this poster in terms of uh, popularity with the audience and her career in Hollywood. She's super in demand. Lucy, Ghost in the Shell, this new uh, Psychopath Test movie, she's huge. Uh, I mean it's partially thanks to Marvel but still at the same day, at the end of the day I think that your three main characters are right there together. And she's you know in the center of the poster I think right above the title for a reason. So that's why Robert Downey Jr. is first. Then you have Chris Hemsworth and Mark Ruffalo, probably also because of contract negotiations. These contracts, you know, they're for a long period of time, and Chris Evans only recently became a big name. When he initially signed on, not a big name, really at a poor point in his career. Even the first Captain America, the first Avenger didn't do well. And I think Chris Hemsworth, it looked like he was going to be a really hot commodity for a while there. That's why he got so many other films. Also, uh, Snow White the Huntsman was a box office performer that he starred in. He will be in the second one. So I think that when his contract was put together, they were able to get something pretty nice for him, which is why you see him with second Billy, even though I think he doesn't totally deserve it. But again, when the contracts were put together, he did. This is contract uh, uh, you know, obligations. Then for Mark Ruffalo, he's a very prestigious actor, uh, Oscar nominated, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's why he's able to get his name higher as well. Uh, because Chris Evans is not Oscar nominated, and Mark Ruffalo, of course, has two Oscar nominations at this point, but when he made his contract, he already had one. So that's why I think you see his name next. Then Chris Evans, then Scarlett Johansson, interestingly enough, then Jeremy Renner, and then you have this with James Spader as Ultron and Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury. Whenever you see a with and an and, that's also contractually obligated. And that's because the character's role, the actor's role isn't big enough for top billing, but the actor feels they're such a big deal, they should just be thrown in there with the rest of the cast. So they get a special with or an and. Uh, and that means even though they go last in the credits, uh, you know, the first group of credits you know, that everybody sees, it's kind of like a, a showing importance. Like, well, this isn't a main role, they're not at the front, but we realize what a big deal it is to have them as a part of the movie. So if you're ever negotiating a contract and you find yourself unable to get top billing, say, well, what, can I get a with or an and? All right, so thank you so much for your question, Tommy. I hope that was helpful. Don't worry, I think Captain America is still a huge part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, evidenced by the fact that Chris Evans no longer says he wants to go and do something else and that his time as Captain America is limited. I think he clearly noticed, uh, realizes this is something that he wants to stick around for and will. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. My voice is getting a little better. I think it still sounds a little off, but it doesn't hurt so much to speak. So thank you so much. Write down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching.